Okay, so welcome to the second lecture uh, for Physics 137. Um, hopefully, hopefully the, the start of the course is soft and gentle for you. Um, we had a two hour lecture yesterday. The first bit was, was mostly going over uh, course structure, syllabus, expectations, etc. Um, so that was a bit of a soft start. And the last hour of yesterday's lecture, we spent discussing the ancient Greeks and what they've kind of determined, uh, which was charges. We know that there's positive and negative charges. And we were sort of blending modern ideas, like we mentioned an electron and we mentioned the charge of an electron. There's no way the ancient Greeks uh, knew that. Uh, we talked about quantization of charge. Again, there's no way the ancient Greeks would have necessarily known that. But starting our story off with the notion of charge, what is charge, how to obtain a charged particle or a charged object, um, that's all very preliminary. And those are sort of the, the big picture notions that the ancient Greeks sort of figured out. Um, so today, we're gonna take a step forward in our narrative, in our plot, maybe chapter two, and we're gonna say, hey, look, um, we, we know that these charges exist, and we, we can tell empirically, very easily, that these charges can, can, can affect one another. They have either forces of attraction or forces of repulsion. And uh, this can be seen very easily, even without fancy equipment, like way back in the ancient Greeks, uh, they were able to notice this. And as a scientist, it's our job to sort of recognize a phenomenon and then try to explain that phenomenon. And that's pretty much what we're doing here. We're recognizing that there's a phenomenon, the phenomenon being um, evidence of charged particles. You know, we can notice, uh, you know, our, our hair being affected by static electricity um, or the, the fur on, on rabbit or what, what have you with amber. And now we're trying to explain the mechanism by which one object can exert a non-contact force on another object beyond the, the, that of gravity. So that's where we're at right now. That's where we're gonna pick up our, our story from last, yesterday's lecture. And um, this is where we're at right now. We're right here. We notice that there's a force. Now we don't know anything about this force yet other than that it exists. So let's go ahead and just give it a symbol name because it, you know it's really hard to start investigating or talking about a phenomenon when you don't develop symbols and language around it so we can have a conversation about it. So um, we can call it, let's say F sub E, the electric force, similar to, let's say, um, the normal force F sub N or the force of friction F sub F. Um, this is just force sub E electric. Uh, if you prefer, you can even write out, yes? We're still looking at your YouTube page. Oh, oops. Thank you. There we go. Cool. Um, I didn't really write much. It was just me talking. Um, so yeah, here we can denote it as F sub E or F sub electric, whatever floats your boat. Um, it's really not picky. Um, please don't think that physicists are overly rigid with, with variable choice. Um, I would say, if anything, physicists are the um, are the, the the people in academia that are the least rigid in terms of of variables because um, we understand even even things like words they're just arbitrary. The spelling of words is arbitrary. I mean, symbols are arbitrary. So we understand that ultimately things are arbitrary as long as you use them logically, where there's no ambiguity. No one really cares. So if you're from high school and you you you're your high school physics teacher used a different notation. As long as it makes sense to read to a, an average person, then who cares? Okay, so I use F sub E. If you want to use something different, go, go nuts. I, I really couldn't care less. Um, what do we know about this electric force so far? Well, we know that so far all we can determine is that it's a non-contact force. That's all pretty much we know about it. Um, so the natural question then as a scientist is to ask ourselves, well, how do the two objects or how do the two particles quote unquote feel the push or pull of one another? You know, with a contact force like friction or, or tension, you can understand that mechanism. There, there's a literal 
connection, a, little, a literal physical bond that when you pull on one object, it transfers the pull through a physical connection, uh, connection to the other object. However, when there's a non-contact force, that sort of underlying mechanism is, is not, not as obvious, which is kind of what Richard Feynman was, was trying to explain in his answer there. Um, you know, his conclusion was you just kind of have to accept that it's there as a fact of nature because there is no other way to explain it that, that would make sense to, to uh, many people, let alone first year students. Um, and quite frankly, I'll be completely frank and, and honest with you, physicists can't even agree on the mechanism. Um, you know, particle physicists, if you ask them how that works, um, they have their own interpretation using, you know, exchange of quarks or quarks or whatever it is. I'm not a particle physicist, but some, some sort of exchange of virtual particles. Uh, and if you ask uh, other people, then it's a completely different mechanism. So physicists can't even agree. There's no possible way we can expect undergrads to grasp this mechanism. So um, relating back to Richard Feynman, I would say take it for face value for now because it is ultimately an unanswered question. So the, how do the, the, the electric forces work? We don't know, just accept that it's there. And that's really all we have to do. And then the rest of it actually becomes, well, fairly simple. You're going to probably, you're probably going to murder me later for saying that it's fairly simple. Um, you're probably not going to share that sentiment, but um, please, please try, try to understand that ultimately, once we get to the end of this lecture, it is a fairly simple idea, assuming you don't ask why, because um, there is no why. Um, okay, so the first step we need to do to uh, solve this problem, to quantify, to investigate this electric force, is we do need to, to introduce the notion of field theory. And again, you can ask why, how did, how did Mark Node introduce field theory to solve this problem? Uh, again, please at the moment take it for face value because it's one of those things where um, there are more complicated aspects going on. And um, the more we ask why, the more I'm gonna have to explain how Grandma Minnie ended up in the hospital after breaking her hip and uh, it's not gonna really do anyone any good. So um, we will get back to field theory momentarily. Uh, before we do though, because we are kind of picking up from where we left off, I wanna see um, kind of how much we, we can understand conceptually our gut intuition about the existence of the electric force. I'm mimicking sort of what the Greeks had to do. The Greeks had no prior knowledge on the electric force. All they had to do, uh, or all they had was, was empirically uh, and what they could witness with their eyes. So let's take this question, for instance. Um, if two balls with charges plus Q and plus four Q uh, are known to be fixed at a separation distance of three R, again, for some, for some value of R, who cares really the exact value, is it possible to place another unknown charge, could be negative charge, could be positive charge, we don't know, somewhere along the line between the two charges such that the net force on this new charge will be zero. Well, what do the Greeks have to go on at this point? Because we don't, the Greeks don't know anything about the electric force. They don't have a formula. They don't have any notion of it at all, other than the fact that they know like charges attract and, uh, sorry, like charges repel and opposite charges attract. Um, the other thing they can tell experimentally is the more, the more charged an object is, the more of, a, of an effect, the, the, the larger the force it can exert on another charged particle. Those are the two easy things that even the ancient Greeks could figure out. So here, um, we think to ourselves, like a thought experiment, if we put a positive charge in the middle, is there a spot, not necessarily in the middle, but is there a spot that we could place this, this unknown charge Q0 such that the net force on it would be zero? Well, if we place the positive charge, then it would repel this guy. So it would feel a force this way. And this is a large charge. Look at 4Q, it's large. So it would feel a larger push to the left. And uh, this is also positive, so it would feel uh, a repulsive force as well, but it's only 1Q, so it would feel a smaller repulsive force. Now, 
presumably, again, something the ancient Greeks could figure out with uh, simple empirical experiments with no fancy equipment. Obviously, the farther the two objects are away from one another, the weaker the force of attraction. They could easily see this with the amber. If they rubbed the amber and they held the amber close to a, a pelt or some fur, um, then there would be a really strong reaction to the fur. It would stand right up on end. But as they pulled the amber away, the fur would, would drop. Uh, in modern times, we see this behavior with a balloon. If you rub your balloon on your hair, if the balloon is in close proximity to your hair, you can get your hair to stand up, but as you pull the balloon away, your hair falls back down. So distance is obviously a factor as well. Again, we don't know the formula. Is it one over r? Is it one over root r? Is it one over r squared? Like, we don't know the exact relationship, but we do know the larger the distance, the weaker the force. So presumably, there would be a location somewhere somewhere maybe to the left of half, like if here's half, it would be somewhere on the left-hand side where the two repulsion forces would balance out. And similarly, if you had a negative charge, a negative charge, instead of having repulsion forces, you'd have attraction forces. So you'd have an attraction with this guy, and then you'd have an attraction with this guy. Either way, there would be a location for either a positive, Q naught or a negative Q naught, there would be a location where the sum of the forces, the net force, would balance out. So the answer in this case would be C, yes, independent of the sign or the value of Q naught. Okay, so here's the story. How do we determine its formula? I've already kind of mentioned uh, we need to introduce field theory, um, but let's not lose sight of our goal, okay? So, First thing, we notice charges exist, and then that led us to uh, noticing that there's a new force that we had not yet known. We'd known about friction, we'd known about tension, you know, we'd known about the applied force um, and, and other types of forces. Now, gravity as well. So now that we have this new force, our, our goal is to come up with a formula for it. So what happens in the middle? And at the moment, it just seems like magic. And this is where most textbooks, I think, and most physics teachers, I think, um, teach physics very wrong. Here's what I mean. If you've taken grade 12 physics, by this point, the physics teacher in grade 12 will say, we have positive charges, we have negative charges, and these, and these charges exert a force on each other. This force is called Coulomb's law and has a, and has a, and has a formula kq1, q2 over r squared. And students are like, okay, there's an electric force and the equation is kq1 q2 over r squared. Done. There's no explanation. Most physics teachers in high school provide no explanation of where this equation comes from, no context for where this equation comes from. And moreover, it's not even true. Um, the electric force is not k1 q2 over r squared. The electric force between two point particles is kq1 q2 over uh, r squared. The electric force between two two arbitrary charged objects is not necessarily kq1 q2 over r squared. So there's a big, 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 big piece of the puzzle that we're missing here. So I'm not going to teach that right away. We're going to teach this later in the course, Coulomb's law that is. First we have to figure out where Coulomb's law comes from and then that way we can better understand how the electric force changes in different situations. So let's introduce field theory. The reason we will need to do this will become clear in a few slides. So for now, please, please bear with me. So what is a field? Not necessarily an electric field, any field. Could be a gravitational field, could be an electric field, could be a magnetic field. Just what is a field? In general, a field you can think of as a force map. So we use road maps, well, well, who uses roadmaps now? Everyone uses Google Maps on their phone. But generally, roadmaps are used by humans to figure out, given where I am, where do I need to go? A field is a force map, meaning if I know I'm at a certain location, let's say I know that I'm right here, given my location, where would I be pushed? Meaning, where, in what direction would the force be, be applied on myself if I was in a certain location? So the way you picture a field is just literally a rectangle of vectors. 
or a field of vectors, a, tiny, a field of tiny little arrows. And depending where you are, you can see the direction of the force that would be applied to a particle had it been in that location. So if I were to put a particle in this location, this force field tells me that it would feel a force this way. Whereas if I put a, a, a particle here in this field, it would feel a force this way. That's what a field is. It is simply a, a mapping of, of both magnitude and direction of where the force would be had you been there. It doesn't necessarily mean you are there. It just means uh, it's like a road map. It doesn't mean you're everywhere on the map simultaneously. It just means if you're at a certain location on the map, you know where you can go. That's what a field is. Now, I'm oversimplifying field theory drastically. So if anyone knows more advanced physics about fields, um, don't shoot me, please. Um, I am fully aware that fields become very complicated. But for a first year level, that's pretty much all you need to know about fields. So more specifically, what does the electric field look like? As I've mentioned before, you can have any sort of field you want. You can have the gravitational field, magnetic field, electric field. So what does the specifically, what does the electric field look like? Well, again, using the Greeks, we only know some very preliminary facts so far. We know that like charges repel and, and opposite charges attract, right? That's the force. So let's see if we can map the force, the direction of the force. So if we have a known positive charge in the middle, notice here how my, my positive charge is, is red because we all know that positive charges are always red. If you zoom in with a microscope, they'll always be red in color under the microscope. This, this is me making fun of textbooks because they always make positive charges red for some reason. Anyway, um, we know that if we were to place a second charge, let's say a positive charge at this location, we know that they would repel each other. So the force that that particle would feel, say, at this green dot would be in this direction. So that is one vector in our electric field. Similarly, if I place a, a, chart, a positively charged particle at this green dot, the second green dot further away, again, it feels a force of repulsion radially away or, or, or directly away from the source. So its electric field will be pointing backwards like this. And simultaneously, you can do this for all the points and you sort of get the idea that um, the direction of the force will be pointing something like this, radially, symmetrically, but radially away. So we call this spherically symmetric. Spherically symmetric, meaning um, if you map all the vectors, it literally looks like a sphere, right? So for a certain radius away, let me change my color here momentarily. For a certain radius away, from the, the central charged particle, every location along my blue dotted line will feel the same magnitude of repulsion force, but just in a different direction. The direction specifically is, is a sphere. So we call that spherically symmetric. Now, how does this help us in our pursuit for force? Well, if we have a, a force map that says, if I know, if I know kind of where I am, and I know who I am, meaning I know, I know what kind of charge I have. If I have those two pieces of information, I know what charge I have and I know where I am, X, Y, Z, then presumably that should be all the information I need to obtain my force. So the relationship is simply F electric is gonna equal Q for, for the, the, the charge on the test particle or on the current particle we're interested in times the electric field at that location. Done. Our pursuit is done. We've, we've achieved our goal. We, we've, we've figured out what the electric force is. It's F equals QE, done. Well, not, not so much, right? We've swapped one problem for another problem. We've, we've solved for the electric force, but we've introduced a new variable, E. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, how, how does that help, Mark? Your, our whole goal is to find F, and you're saying, oh, now we found F, we're done. Um, we've, just, we've, we've solved F by introducing another variable E. Good job. Um, you're right. 
You're absolutely right. It seems ridiculous at first. And I remember as a first year student, it took me uh, well beyond first year to really appreciate the, the usefulness of the E-field. So again, back to Richard Feynman, it's one of those things where um, the importance of the E-field can't really be explained at this level uh, to things that you can relate to. So it's, it's one of those things that for now anyway, you're just gonna have to accept as being useful and, and trust trust the fact that you know we know what we're doing. So unfortunately, I will continue the story, but uh, for the usefulness of the E-field, please trust me at the moment that it is just, it is useful. Um, I will try to illustrate why um, without, without regurgitating a textbook, but um, let's, let's just use this relationship for now and kind of see how much we can figure out. Um, by the way, we are well beyond the Greeks now. We've left the Greeks so far behind um, you know, we're, we're right up into the 20th century now with this, with this sort of uh, understanding. So, um, new equation, let's do a very, quick, a very quick question. So in a uniform electric field, uh, in an empty space, a four Coulomb charge is, pl is placed as shown below, and it is known to feel an electric force of 12 newtons. Okay, so F electric we know is 12 newtons. We know the charge is four coulombs. If this charge is then removed and a second charge of six coulombs is placed there instead, what force would it experience? And um, this is one that the, this, this question sort of partially illustrates the usefulness of the electric field. Uh, the electric field is, is um, is the thing that is there independent of the specific charge we're talking about, right? So for instance, the electric field is responsible for causing the 12 newtons of electric force. So if we know we have 12 newtons of electric force and four coulombs of charge, how strong does the electric field have to be to produce 12 newtons of force for, for four coulombs of charge? And simply, that's gonna be three. And what are the units? Well, you can see here by dividing, it's gonna be newtons per coulomb. So the electric field is three newtons per coulomb. Now we can take this information because if we swap out the charge and put in a, a six coulomb charge instead of a four coulomb charge, that doesn't affect the, the, the external electric field, right? That just changes what object we've placed there. So in this scenario, we still have an electric field of three uh, newtons per coulomb, but now we've got a different charge. So to know what the force is, we simply compute F equals QE, and that's gonna be six times three, which equals 18 newtons per coulomb. So the answer is 18. Okay, um, let's increment uh, momentarily. I mean, if you're in computer science, let's, let's do force plus plus, so to speak. So what is the magnitude of the electric field such that an electron, is, uh, an electron placed in the electric field would experience an electrical force equal to its own, uh, its own weight? Now, this is a, a little bit funny, but it, it's actually relevant and I'll explain why momentarily. So we have a known electric field, right? E equals question mark. We know it's there, we don't know its magnitude, I should say. And um, we know that the charge is the charge of that on an electron. So we know that that's 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And uh, we know its weight, well, rather we know the mass of an electron. Uh, you can look it up. I believe it's 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Am I right? Is there a next? No, okay, I don't know. It, I think it's 9.11. We can, we can Google it later if we care, but it's, it's a value that we can easily Google. And uh, we wanna know what, what electric field do we need to exert so that the electric force is equal to its, its weight. So it's telling us exactly how to do the question. We wanna know when this is true, Fe equals Fg. So we know the electric force is Q times the electric field, and we know the force of gravity is M times G. 
So that would mean the electric field is M times G over the charge of an electron. Now, you can plug in specific values if you care to. Um, I, I simply don't care at the moment because that's not the point. Um, the usefulness, though, of this, of this example is that this is exactly how, um, if you solve it the other way, this is exactly how Millikan solved for the, the charge on an electron. What, he, what Millikan did was, Millikan had, um, well, actually, I'm drawing this the wrong way. Millikan had an E field uh, there in, in a, a vertical E field in a chamber. And oh no, uh, electrons are blue, right? Electrons are blue. So uh, he had an electron in a chamber and um, it was being levitated by an electric field. And Millikan was able to control the strength of the electric field with a knob. And he was able to use, for lack of a better description, we'll say a microscope. Um, and he was able to, to visually see uh, what, I think they were oil actually, uh, oil droplets that had an excess of electrons on them, so a charged oil drop. And he was able to adjust the strength of the electric field to perfectly balance gravity. And he used this to sort of reverse engineer Q, the charge of an electron. So um, that's it's a really simple idea, but quite revolutionary for Millikan's time. So anyway, uh, again, why is an E-field useful? This is another example why an E-field is useful. Uh, okay, now, what does an electric field look like if we had a negative source charge? You'll recall that the previous illustration we had was for a positive source, but if we have, let's say, a negative source, what would it look like? Well, again, a field is simply a mapping of the force that it would feel uh, if you were to place a second object somewhere. So let's place a second object here. Let's say it's a positive object. Where would the force be at that location? Well, simply, it would be an attractive force because opposites attract. If we placed another, um, if we placed another positive charge over here, then it would feel also an attractive charge toward that negative one. It would be farther away, so it would be weaker, but nonetheless, it would be radially inward. If we um, placed, oops, if we placed a, a positive charge close to the electric charge, then it would be quite a strong attractive charge because it would be really close. Point being, the electric field, if you had a negative source, would look something like this. You'd have the electric field lines coming radially inwards compared to with a positive test charge, if you recall over here, was radially outwards. Okay, now in 136 we briefly discussed the notion of superposition, specifically superposition of waves. This is where if you have multiple waves that interfere with one another uh, or overlap with one another, you simply just add their amplitudes together. Uh, it's no more complicated than that. Um, this is actually a really nice principle of superposition because um, in the macroscopic world, this isn't true. If two objects try to occupy the same space in real life, they just collide. For instance, that's how car accidents happen. That's not the case when you deal with waves. You have superposition, they can just, you simply add their amplitude. They can co-inhabit the same space without even batting an eyelash. So electric fields are actually very similar. Uh, this should make sense because it's just a force mapping. If, if, I, if I have one source, let's say this positive source here, then um, I'm gonna, I, at this location here, it's gonna have a force this way, radially away from, from the first upper source. However, if you have a second uh, positive charge nearby, let's say down here, then it will also have its own electric field at this location, and it is specifically pointed upwards. Well, if you add forces, just like you can have multiple forces on the same object, no problem. If you add those two forces, then they cancel. Down plus up equals nothing, which is why um, there are no field lines here at the center, because they perfectly cancel out. 
Um, similarly, if you have, let's say, a plus and a negative, well, at the center, you have a repulsion force from the positive one, and you have an attractive force from the negative one. So they add together, just as, as so two forces in the same direction would add together, and then you get a really strong electric field pointed downward right at the center. So point being here, superposition of fields uh, is, is very natural and, and very much a thing. Uh, and we can piggyback on our understanding of superposition from 136 in the waves unit. Um, or if you're just happy accepting the premise of superposition in fields, there's no need to piggyback. But you can piggyback if you'd like. So here's an example of, uh, of what I mean by a superposition of fields. So we have two sources here. Um, we have negative two coulombs on the top left corner of a square and negative two coulombs on the, on the bottom left corner of a square. And we're interested to know what the net electric field is at the center of the square. So the way you would solve this is you'd say, okay, well, we have um, an attractive force uh, going diagonally up toward the top left of the square because of um, this, the, this minus two Coulomb charge. And we have another force pulling um, southwest, so to speak, in the, in the bottom left-hand corner of the square. So if you were to draw a free body diagram, your free body diagram would look sort of like this. They're equal length, um, different directions. And um, it, hopefully our understanding of free body diagrams is, is up to par. You can see that this is the same theta. So in fact, the horizontal components, or not the horizontal, the vertical components would cancel out. And the only thing that would remain are the two independent um, uh, leftwards, horizontal leftwards components. And those would be the only ones that would remain. So the answer would be, oh, I'm drawing black on black. Of course, you can't see that. The, the answer here would be C. There you go. Um, okay, so for time purposes, I don't think I want to do a lot of these. Um, by all means, you can go back and look at these on your own. Um, they're all on the slides along with the answers. Okay, so again, let's come back to this equation, F equals QE. I'm trying to assert to you that Although it appears as though we've just simply swapped out one problem for another problem, like we don't know four. So yes, we do. It's F equals QE. Okay, well, what's E? Yeah, we swapped out one problem for another problem, but actually the equation F equals QE is remarkably useful. So let's see why. We've already partially seen why above. Let's continue to see why. How do E fields interact within conductors? And Brilliantly, the equation F equals QE is able to answer this question. So it's a pretty powerful little equation, even though we haven't really done anything. So for instance, let's assume we have an external electric field. That's these red lines here. That's just an electric field that we generate in space or in air or whatever. And we just, with our hand, we take, let's say, an aluminum block, a chunk of metal something that is known to be a conductor, okay? Something where charges within it can flow and separate easily. Okay, well, we know an electric field is effectively just a force map. So we know that within a conductor, there are, there are delocalized electrons that are free to move. So we know th there's a, the positive charges Will, will be pushed toward the right, right? Because that's where the electric field is pointing. So all the positive charges will be pushed as far to the right as, as possible. Obviously, you can't push them outside of the object, so they're, they're butting up against the, the right-hand side of the object. And the electrons are gonna be feeling a, a, a force of attraction to this electric field. So if the electric field is pointing uh, to the right, then the electrons will actually be attracted toward the left. So the left-hand side of this metal will be, uh, is where all the electrons will be. Now, this sort of charge separation within, within the object is what's interesting. 
the charge separation within the object has its own electric field, right? You can't forget each of these uh, positive charges are emitting their own electric fields, right? And each of these electrons are emitting their own electric fields. The protons are, their electric fields are radially away. So my red arrows that I drew are pointing away from the positive charges. And the electrons have the reverse. They're pointing inwards towards themselves. So you'll see here that in the middle of the conductor, we have, we have um, this contribution that's pointing to the left. And we have the negative contribution that's also pointing to the left. So overall, overall, we have a net E field inside the conductor that's pointing backwards. Let's call that E prime, an induced E field, so to speak. Well, you can't forget that we also had an external E field, E, that is also passing through. So you have E passing to the right, you have E prime, the induced E field, passing to the left, and they perfectly cancel out. Now, they will only perfectly cancel out if we have a conductor. They will only perfectly cancel out if the charges within the object are free to move without hindrance. If we have, say, things like a piece of wood where electrons are not able to freely move, then the electrons would, would want to move because there's an electric field, but um, they, wouldn't be, they would be prevented from moving. They would, be, they would be attached and bound to the atom that they're, they're currently in. They wouldn't be allowed to travel. So again, that's the difference between a conductor and, and an insulator. So the equation F equals QE is quite remarkable because again, we haven't really done anything other than introduce a, an electric field. There are a notion of an electric field and that within itself is enough to predict that within any conductor, any chunk of metal will always have a zero E field. Because if you have an external E field, it will induce an opposite E field inside the conductor to perfectly cancel out what was applied to it. So inside of a piece of metal will always, always, always have a zero E field. That's pretty cool. Now, there's a small caveat, I must say, to this. Um, I gotta change my color so you can see it. It's this right here. It assumes, uh, this is true when there's no current. Um, of course, what does this mean? We haven't talked about current yet. Current means uh, when things move, or specifically when charges are moving. So there is no uh, electric field inside a conductor when the charges are stationary. This means as the charges are in the process of separating, because uh, originally when the, when the chunk of metal is not in an electric field, everything is sort of randomized. And when you apply the electric field, there is gonna be a non-zero time in which the charges need to travel. While they're traveling, of course, there's gonna be some non-zero E field inside. But once, everything, once everyone has taken positions and they're ready to go, uh, and they're all at the, at the opposite ends, um, and everything is stationary, that's when everything becomes an equilibrium and the net electric field inside is zero. Now, we can take this a step further, in fact. They don't even have to be solid chunks of metal. As long as the electrons have an ability to travel from one side to the other side through at least one path, you can have, let's say, a hole inside your chunk of metal. A hole still lets electrons flow, right? Electrons can flow along the top and the bottom here, and they can still organize themselves as physics makes them. Now, inside this hollow cavity, you are still, in fact, going to have no electric field, which is really, really cool. I can take that even, even a step further. If we take 
a positively, let's say, uh, for instance, it could be negatively charged as well. If we take a, a positively charged particle and place it at the center of a hollow um, a metal object, um, there's metal all the way around the object, in per per uh, perfectly uh, surrounding it with no air gaps. Um, then what we see here is inside the air gap, obviously, there's going to be an electric field because it's, it, it's emitted by, um, it's emitted by the, the, the charge Q. And then uh, it will attract all the negative electrons in the metal toward the inside edge, and it will push. All, now, I, I say push the proton. Protons, of course, can't move. So I guess in this case, a, a positive charge is, is really the absence of electrons. Um, so all the positive charges are then going to be quote unquote pushed to the opposite edge. And um, these, these positive charges along the opposite or the outside edge will themselves be emitting their own E fields outwards like this. And uh, again, it's a, it's a spherically symmetric uh, E field. So the E fields from these positive charges will also be pointed inwards. However, the E fields from the electrons will um, cancel, cancel out from inside because you have the red line. Oh, let me draw this in red. You have the red line that goes through and you have the induced green line that comes backwards and they perfectly cancel out. So inside this metal conductor is still zero, but it's, this is the weird part because you have a source of electric field, positive Q inside, and somehow you're able to sort of interrupt the electric field and then re-emit the electric field later. That's so cool to me. And this is all a result of F equals QE. Now, an intuitive explanation why this is true is simply Newton's second law, F net equals ma. Luckily, charge, well, charges are fun because they're not only particles with mass, but they're also charged. Now, luckily for us, they are still particles with mass. So we can analyze their motion using Newton's second law. So assuming everything is stationary, as I said before, there's no current, then assuming everything is stationary, then the acceleration is zero. So let's see if we can use Newton's second law to understand why the E field inside must be zero, assuming everything is stationary. So we can do this with a proof by contradiction, if you're familiar with that sort of notion. First, we can assume, Mark, how do you know that's true? How do you, how do you know the electric field inside is zero? Why does it have to be zero? What, what if it's not zero? Okay, well, let's, let's try. If the electric field inside was not equal to zero, even though everything is stationary, then we know this, this relationship is true, F equals QE. So if we assume that the, the E field inside is non-zero, you want to prove me wrong? Go for it. Let's assume the E field is not zero. Then this means that you have a non-zero force. Well, you have a non-zero force because E is non-zero, which means F is non-zero. So looking at Newton's second law, if F is non-zero, then A is non-zero. And if the acceleration is non-zero, then there will be movement because it's accelerating. And the premise was assuming everything is stationary, there must be a zero uh, electric field inside. So it's impossible to have something be stationary and have a non-zero electric field. So this, that's, a, that's an example of a proof by contradiction um, in physics, which is uh, not as rare as you might think. OK, now this leads me to the notion of a Faraday cage. The notion of having zero electric field inside of a, of a chunk of metal is a very, very well-known phenomenon. Uh, it's so well-known and so interesting and so useful. We've, in fact, called it a Faraday cage. We've, we've named it after the, um, the, one of the, the physicists in, in e &M, Michael Faraday. Um, effectively, what the Faraday cage says is any object inside a Faraday cage or, or in the hollow opening inside of a piece of conducting material 
will not feel uh, any sort of electric field um, that is applied, whether it be weak or strong. So um, there's a, lots of different examples of Faraday cages that exist. Um, do I have examples on the next? Yeah, I do. Um, there, I have examples on the next slide for you, but I want to sort of, actually, no, I'll show you the next slide first and then, and then show you the video. So we've seen, we've seen this. I, I don't think really, well, I'm making a, a bit of a generality here. I don't think millennials are really the, the group of people who use um, these little pouches for their credit cards. I think it's more so my parent generation <laughs> who use them. Um, I don't know, there might be a few millennials and Gen Zs that use them, but um, you've seen these sort of credit card or debit card protectors where you can slip them in, slip in your credit card or debit card, and they, they argue that, uh, oh, this will prevent people from stealing the tap, the, the tap chip information from your credit card. That seems hokey, um, but really the, the, the science is, is quite sound. It's, it's a Faraday cage. This is not just simply a piece of plastic. Inside here, you actually have a very thin, a very thin metal mesh or conducting mesh in the same way that you see here. There's like a conducting mesh and they just coat the mesh with plastic to sort of make it stronger and more durable and to keep the shape of a, of a, of a sleeve, so to speak. But you know, it doesn't matter that you coat it in plastic. What matters is there's still metal surrounding this card. So the way in which you can, you know, you use your tap is the machines that accept a tap card, they, they send out, we'll get to it later in the class, but they effectively send out an electromagnetic uh, pulse and they read the response from the card. This prevents that electric field to actually hit the card um, because it's a Faraday cage. There's no electric field allowed within a Faraday cage. Similarly, um, it, a microwave. A microwave is a Faraday cage. A microwave is mostly a metal box. Uh, five of the six sides of a, of a microwave are solid metal. And the glass part, you'll notice if you look at a microwave, the glass part is a metal mesh. Well, there's a metal mesh inside the glass part, a metal mesh that's very similar to, say, this mesh here that I've, I've shown on the slide. So when the door is closed and the food is inside, um, you are safe because the, the, the Faraday cage keeps everything, you know, safe inside. Um, and the video that I'm about to show you is relating to this. Um, this is also a Faraday cage. And this, this is showing um, lightning, which is an electromagnetic phenomenon, um, being arced to the Faraday cage because it's metal and metal will attract lightning. Um, however, the people standing inside the cage are perfectly safe. Even if they put their hand up and touch the mesh, they're still safe because as long as their hand is less conductive than the metal and their hand is inside the cage, they're perfectly safe. So there's a video I have for you here. Um, I think I've shared my computer sound. Let me just double check. Yes, I have. So there's a video I have for you here from YouTube. If you're familiar with Mythbusters, uh, which most of you hopefully are, um, Adam Savage is one of the hosts of Mythbusters. Uh, he get, probably got paid a lot of money to do this, but uh, he was a guest appearance on some sort of science demonstration to a large audience of people. And what they do is they have a Tesla coil shooting sparks at a Faraday cage with Adam Savage inside the Faraday cage. And uh, it, this is sort of living proof that if you understand physics and you trust physics, then you can actually do a lot of really fun, cool things very safely. So um, hope you enjoy the video of a Faraday cage. Oops. Come on, will it load? For it, TV, the world is thinking. We are now going to transport Adam Savage exactly one nanosecond into the future. We got a short and sweet one from him. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Savage does Arc Attack. Hey, Joe, you gotta plug him in. Ah.
All right, so uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. I think you get the idea in the last few seconds. It's more of the, um, more of the same thing. Uh, so yeah, that was the, the Doctor Who theme song. So for those of you who knew that, good job. Um, I think you're sort of seeing tidbits into my personality by kind of the videos that I show you. Um, I absolutely love Doctor Who. I have a TARDIS mug. Um, it's a square mug, so it's a little bit awkward to drink out of, but um, I love it nonetheless. Um, Doctor Who is one of those weird shows that really makes no sense, but for some reason it's just really good. Um, they, they contradict themselves so many times and the way they fix it is they just say, oh, tiny whiny. They're literally verbatim, that is their quote, tiny whiny. Um, anyway, so uh, that, that's an example of a Faraday cage. Um, for those of you who are actually uh, wanting another fun, kind of fun video of, of, a, of a Tesla coil in the Faraday cage, by the way, we will talk about Tesla coils in depth later in this course. So if you're wondering kind of where that lightning came from, hold on to that enthusiasm. In fact, um, just to prove to you uh, that we will be talking about it, not just talking about it, but like that it will be a main theme um, in this course, I want to show you or at least remind you, um, if you look at our course picture on Canvas, after I log in, of course, if you look at our course picture on Canvas, um, great, I don't know if you can see my, my um, pointer here, but it's a picture of a Tesla coil arcing to a Faraday cage. So um, we have just exactly touched the surface of the main talking point of this entire course. So if you're wanting to know more information about that video, by the end of this class, you should be able to explain every single facet of the physics that happened in that video. So looking forward to that one. Okay, um, one last application of the equation F equals QE. It's kind of interesting, actually. It, it, it's something that if left to my own devices, me personally, I never would have stumbled upon this discovery on my own. Um, since I've been told it, it makes sense to me. It's just one of those obscure facts that I, I never in a million years would have stumbled upon on my own. But the fact is that the electric field uh, must, 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 must meet the surface of, a, of a, a conductor at a 90 degree angle. It must. And um, for those of you who uh, had a keen eye, <clears throat> a few slides previous, here specifically, you will have noticed that the electric field lines, when they came in, they bent to meet the um, the conductor. And this, this was not done by accident. This was not a mistake by the illustrator of this figure. Um, this was done on purpose because part of the equation F equals QE dictates that they must bend and meet the surface at a 90 degree angle. So why is this true? Um, again, we can, we can look at it by proof by contradiction. Um, again, we assumed that these charges were stationary, right? So if, for instance, the electric field came in on an angle, proof by contradiction, let's assume that it's not 90 degrees at some, some sort of other angle. Let's say, oops, what did, what did, my, my hand must have touched something there. Here, let's say the electric field comes in at a non 90 degree angle. Well, then we can use components. Part of the component of the E field will be perpendicular. Part of the component of the E field will be parallel. So the perpendicular component, yes, the perpendicular component will make this, this positive charge uh, feel a force upwards. No problem. That means the charge will be pressed against the edge of the conductor. And then it'll stop there because it's got nowhere to go other than to just get squeezed against the edge of the conductor. However, if there was a parallel component to the E field, then the equation F equals QE means there would be um, uh, a, a component of the electric field in the X direction, which means there would be a force in the X direction. And the, the charged particle would move in the X direction. It would move in this case, according to this diagram, to the right. And uh, this would be equal to MA, and there would be an acceleration to the right. Well, that violates our assumption that the object is stationary. Right, so again, we have this notion of electro, electrostatics. 
That's what the word static means in electrostatics. Statics means stationary, not moving. So when you have electrostatics, you have Faraday cages, you have no electric field inside of a chunk of metal, and you have um, E fields that bend and meet the, the conducting surface at 90 degrees. So we can deduce all of these cool things just from the equation F equals QE alone. So hopefully these, these examples uh, help illustrate the, the, the usefulness of the electric field. And you'll notice in these examples, we didn't even really do much with the electric field. It was merely the presence of the electric field or the existence of the electric field that allowed us to make these conclusions. So, um, of course, as you go on in physics, the usefulness of the electric field becomes more concrete and more technical and more apparent. But I'm hoping these sort of cherry picked examples um, allowed you to sort of appreciate that, yes, in fact, there is a usefulness to this electric field. Uh, this slide is just showing the bending specifically. It was the same thing that I showed you just previous. So a brief summary up until now. Um, let's, again, we've talked about a lot of things. Our story is kind of getting confusing. Um, we know that there are positive and negative charges, and the most fundamental of which has a magnitude of, of E. So you can either have a, a, a proton, which has a positive E charge, or an electron that has a negative E charge. Uh, e stands for electron, I guess. Uh, certain materials or atoms will have the ability to be polarized. Not all atoms, but certain. Uh, and this allows charged particles to then attract it, so things like styrofoam. Conductors are defined to be material that easily allows for uh, charge to flow, and insulators simply are, just, are not. There are three main ways of obtaining charged objects, or more specifically, three main ways of transferring charge. There's friction, uh, charge separation, also known as induction, and conduction, which means a simple touch, which is what happens when you touch your metal door and you get a shock. Um, there, there, there's an electric force between two charged particles. That's something we've established. We have yet to figure out what the formula is, but we're incrementing our way there. Um, we do know the relationship between force and the electric field is F equals QE. Um, what do we know about E? Just again, using our gut intuition and our logic. We know uh, the E field due to a point source is spherically symmetric. We know that the E field will get weaker as we get farther away. We don't know how weak. Could be linear, could be square, could be logarithmic, could be root, who knows. Um, but we do know it gets weaker as it gets farther away. Um, we also know that there is no electric field inside of a conductor, and this has led to the discovery of Faraday cages. So that's sort of a brief summary of what we've done so far. Um, let's not lose sight of our goal. I think when we're doing science, um, students of science, uh, they have it good because the answers are already there and we're just kind of spoon feeding you the answers. When, you're, when you are a scientist and you're having to do research, it is significantly more frustrating because the answers don't exist yet. I mean, I suppose nature has all the answers, but we don't know what nature knows, right? So being a scientist is, is a lot like being a student, but harder because we don't have professors to ask for help when we're confused. So this is what I'm trying to teach students in this class is not only the physics, but also to think like a scientist because hopefully you all do end up going into the scientific field in some capacity and you are gonna to need to be using your scientific skills and your problem solving skills. So I'm trying to mimic that process in this class a little bit. So don't lose sight, we've, we've come a long way, but don't lose sight of our goal. Our goal is to still quantify the electric force. All right, so now it's time to introduce Max, the idea of Maxwell's equations. There are four equations that govern the entirety of electro, the field of electromagnetism. Now, you're sort of used to these, I, the notion of governing equations, although they may not have been called governing equations. Um, F net equals MA is a governing equation of motion. It's one of the governing equations of motion. 
Um, you also know the conservation of energy. That's another head honcho main equation. Conservation of momentum is another head honcho main equation. Um, equations that you normally find yourself starting with at the start of most problems, for instance, like F net equals MA, um, those are typically what we call governing equations. In chemistry, a governing equation is, is say, Pivner. That's what we call the equation of state. So um, every field, every scientific field, usually has a sort of a set of governing equations. In the field of electromagnetism, I'm telling you ahead of time for perspective, they're called Maxwell's equations, and there are four of them. Now, they are very calculusly, uh, calculus y and very complicated. We, we won't go too deep into the calculus for this class. Um, I will touch upon the calculus a little bit because I believe you need to have some sort of insight into the calculus to fully appreciate what these equations are saying. Now, I don't know who this brave soul is who uh, was brave enough to get a tattoo. I have wanted a, a tattoo of Maxwell's equations for many years. I'm just too much of a chicken shit to get a tattoo. Um, I am deathly scared of needles. Um, I will get vaccines when I need to get them, but it's after a, a lot of a lot of well, metaphoric crying inside. So I would love to get a tattoo like this. I, I'm just too scared to do it. But these are Maxwell's four equations. Um, these are what we call differential form. So uh, in terms of differentials, like the derivative, for instance. Um, I think Maxwell's equations, based on my experience, I think they make more sense when you talk about them in terms of their integral form, both of which are calculus, right? Whether you take differential or, or derivatives or integrals, they're, they're still calculus, but they're just different representations. I think, especially for first year, I think it makes more sense to talk about Maxwell's equations in terms of uh, the integral form. So here are the four. And they're going to be in the order, mostly in the order in which we are going to teach them. So the first one is called Gauss's Law. And it's given by, by this equation here. Um, the second one is called Gauss's Law for Magnetism. Uh, the reason why it's called Gauss's Law for Magnetism is because if you look at these two equations, they look very similar. Integral of E dot dA equals something. This one is the integral of B dot dA equals something. So it's a very similar structure. So um, if one's called Gauss's law, the other one is probably called Gauss's law as well. It's just the difference is E goes to B. So magnetism, you know, for the sign that B in magnetism. Uh, we'll get to magnetism later. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Um, yeah, I, I mean, E for electric field makes sense. I don't know who came up with B for magnetism. I don't know, weird. Anyway, moving on. Uh, the third one is called Faraday's law. And the, the fourth one is called uh, Ampere's Law. Now, um, just for some context, I want to uh, write the English words, and then I will relate the English words of, of this field to the relevant equations. So we have elect, oops, electrostatics. We have magneto. Statics. We have electrodynamics, and we have magnetodynamics. You know what dynamics means from 136. Dynamics means motion. So electrostatics means electricity that is not moving. What equation out of Maxwell's equations? What equation involves E without time. E without time. There's no time in this equation at all. So electrostatics is governed by Gauss's law. Okay, magnetostatics. Magneto means magnetism. Statics means no time. Like they're stagnant, they're not moving. So out of the remaining three Maxwell equations, what has B but no T? This one. Electrodynamics. Electro, electric, dynamics, time. Which of the remaining two uh, equations, Maxwell's equations, deals with something electric as a function of time? Something electric as a function of time. So the governing equation that does, uh, the, that, that 
predicts and governs electrodynamics is Faraday's law. And then last but not least, I guess process of elimination, uh, magnetodynamics is, is governed by something called Ampere's law. And you might be thinking to yourself, okay, yeah, magneto, there's the B, but Mark, there's no time, you're lying to us. Well, you will, you will soon realize or learn that current is in fact moving charges. Moving charges means how much charge Q moves per unit time T, dQ by dT. So there, there's an embedded, a hidden T in the quantity of current. So um, this is an example of how things uh, are labeled appropriately and named appropriately and logically. Electrostatics, it's the equation that has electro and no time. Magnetostatics has magnetism and no time. So there's gonna be a lot of equations in this course. And hopefully this sort of intuitive understanding of how the names and the equations are used, um, hopefully that helps you figure out when to use one equation uh, versus another equation. Um, we'll get back to this notion later. Uh, this slide is just showing students that the electric field and magnetic field are coupled to one another. Um, I'm gonna revisit this topic much later in the course once we've established kind of everything else we need to get there. Um, this is a useful table for you to refer to throughout 137. I don't wanna dwell on it in lecture because it's more so a reference table. This is a colloquial understanding of, of how to think about and how to interpret each of the four Maxwell's equations for you. So as you're going through the course, let's say you do a question and you're confused and I help you or you, you in some fashion determine the solution and you're like, okay, I needed Gauss's law for this question. Well, why did you need Gauss's law? How did this other person who knew how to do the question, how did they know they needed Gauss's law? Come back to this table and say, okay, Gauss's law, what does Gauss's law do? It relates the, the source of the electric field to the electric field that the source produces. So if you have a question that says things like, oh, you know, we have a bunch of charges, blah, 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 blah. What's the electric field generated by a bunch of charges? Well, that screams Gauss's law because Gauss's law is literally the equation that relates the source charge to the resulting E field. We wouldn't use Faraday's law for that. We would use Gauss's law for that. So hopefully as you're going through this course, you're doing homework, you can use this table here to sort of help guide you and to identify which of four Maxwell's equations that you need. Okay, moving right along. Um, a little anecdote, I'm full of anecdotes. Um, I'm definitely a cat person. Romina is also very much a cat person. Um, I don't know if she's mentioned that about herself in the chat, but I'm gonna reveal that part of her for her. Um, I have a totally black cat. Um, his name is Max, or Max Max for, uh, for short, even though Max Max is longer. And I named him after Maxwell's equations. The, the physicist that sort of um, put all of these four equations together and formalized what we now know to be the field of electromagnetism, that physicist's name is James Clerk Maxwell. So uh, I named my cat Max after Maxwell. And black cat, I mean, I could have named him Schrodinger or something like that, but I'm not a chemist, so no. Um, his name is Max. And he might make an appearance throughout the semester, I'm not sure. Um, I think he's presently uh, asleep upside down in front of a, a sunbeam at in the window downstairs. So um, I don't know, maybe sometime throughout the semester you'll see him kind of hop up on the table or something, we'll see. Okay, anyway, um, back to the point. Gauss's law, where does that leave us? How does this help us obtain a, uh, our, our, our end goal for the electric force? Well, before I explain Gauss's law, let me explain why we need Gauss's law in our pursuit for Fe. Recall that the electric force was Q times E. Meaning, if we obtained a formula for E, we're done. Because then we just multiply E by Q and we have F, done, yay. Although F equals QE alone was able to predict some pretty cool things like Faraday cages, we still weren't able to come up with a formula for Fe, for the electric force. Gauss's law, however, Gauss's law
relates the electric field to the, the source of the electric field. In this case, it would be a charge, Q. Meaning, Gauss's law says, if we know the charge distribution, then there should be a way to come up with the net electric field over all of space. And that just makes sense, right? If, if I know that there's a plus here and a minus here and a plus here, and I superimpose all those together, there should be a way to come up with what the electric field is across all of the x, y, z's, across all of the coordinates in all of space. And uh, there is a way to do it, and that mechanism is Gauss's law. Sorry for my messy handwriting. I know that that looks like chicken scratch. This is why I have prepared lecture slides that are not subject to my chicken scratch. So Gauss's law allows us to obtain a formula for the E field, and then we can take that formula for the E field and then subsequently obtain my force F. So that's what we're doing here. Now, I could just jump right to using Gauss's law, but I know calculus is sort of new and daunting to you guys. So we're going to take some time and kind of step through um, the meaning of Gauss's law. So Gauss's law was, that was a T over epsilon naught. So Gauss's law says it's the integral of E dot dA equals Q total over epsilon naught. That's the formula for Gauss's law. Now, Q total is simply just the total charge. Easy enough to figure out. Epsilon naught is just a, a, a universal constant, just like capital G, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. You know, that's capital G. Um, it's just a universal constant. It has a value. There's nothing physical to it, really. I mean, we'll get there a little bit later. But for the most part, the right-hand side of Gauss's law, there's nothing complicated about it. It's pretty much just total charge. The left-hand side of Gauss's law, however, is a little bit more daunting, meaning what, what is this? What is the integral of E dot dA? What does that even mean? Um, in, in, if you've taken first year calculus, for instance, um, you know what the integral of F dx is. It's the area under the curve. But F isn't a vector. What is the integral? What does it even mean to take the integral of a vector? Why is there a dot product in the integral? And what is dA? You know, I know what f of x dx is. dx is like an incremental step in the x direction, but what is dA? Why, why, why is there a vector on it? You know, there's just, there's a lot going on here. I fully understand. So let's see if we can sort of break it down and put an intuitive understanding to Gauss's law for you. Ignore the integral sign for a second. Let's just look at the quantity e vector dot product dA vector. What is dA? dA is just an area. dA is an, is an infinitesimally small amount of area in the same way that x is a, a horizontal distance and dx is an incrementally small uh, uh, step in, in that horizontal direction. That's all A is. A is area, dA is an incrementally small chunk of area. So this here, this little rectangle there is dA. It's an incrementally small amount of area. Now, why is it a vector? Well, that's a great question. We've been teaching students since grade five, maybe even before, depending where you're from, that area is a scalar. You know, how big is this table? This table is 1.5 square meters in area. It doesn't really make sense to say it's 1.5 square meters left, okay? We've been teaching students for years and years and years and years and years that area is simply a scalar. However, if we had to assign a direction to it, there is a natural direction in which we can assign this area. And it's simply in which direction the face of the area is pointing. So your table, presumably you're all at, probably sitting at some sort of desk or table or coffee table, okay? The, the vector for that, that table you're sitting on will be pointing straight up toward the ceiling because the face, your desk is facing upwards, okay? So the area vector of your desk is up. In the same way, if I draw a rectangle here, like I've done so here, if I had to assign an area, sorry, a, a vector to this area, it would be the perpendicular to the face. So that's what the yellow, that's what the yellow vector here is. It's, it's a vector pointing perpendicular to the face of the area. 
Okay, so now we know what dA is, and now we know what dA vector is. Okay, so check, we know what this is. E, of course, we know what the E field is. We've talked about that before. In the picture that I've shown here, the electric field are just these white background lines here that are kind of flowing horizontally. Okay, what's next? Well, the last piece of the puzzle is this, this pesky dot product. You will remember from grade 12 calculus and vectors, MCV 4 uo uh, what a dot product is. Hopefully you will also remember from physics 136 what a dot product is. A dot B is going to be the magnitude of vector A times the magnitude of vector B times cos theta. Now, more specifically, what this means is it is the component of vector B that is in the vector A direction that is parallel to vector A. So if I had to draw a picture, let's say this is vector B, let's say this is vector A, then what we're doing is we're saying, okay, vector B has two components. Vector B has the parallel component, and vector B has the perpendicular component, and A dot B is simply going to be, or a dot b is simply going to be vector a times the, the magnitude of vector a times the magnitude of the parallel component of b. And the parallel component of b, if this is the angle theta here, is simply given by b cos theta. So what we're doing here with e dot product dA is we want to know how much of the electric field line E is in the same direction as the area vector? That's all we're do doing. Now, why, why is this important? Well, let's look at the next slide. When you have the area of this rectangle, say, oriented according to panel one, you have the area of this of this rectangle directed perfectly horizontal toward the right. Coincidentally, the E field is also pointed perfectly to the right. So how many electric field lines are passing through this rectangle? We have one, we have two, we have three, we have four. Now, if I change the orientation of this area and I tilt it, the E field remains unchanged. It's still horizontal. It's still the same strength as before. The E field is not changing. The size of this rectangle is not changing. I'm not shrinking the rectangle. I'm not making the rectangle larger. So the magnitude of dA is not changed. However, the angle is now different. It's less than nine, sorry, it's, um, it's greater than zero now. Right here they were parallel, so theta was zero, cos of zero is one. Here the angle is greater than zero and cos of an angle bigger than zero will be less than one. Why is this important? Well, let's count. How many field lines are going through this, this rectangle now? Now we only have one, two. Whereas before we had four, now we have two. Now, if we take it to an extreme, if we have the, the, the normal to the area pointing directly down and the E field is pointed directly to the right, i.e. theta equals 90 degrees, mathematically cos of 90 is zero, so E dot dA times zero will be zero. But why, does, why is it zero? Why, why are we looking for this? How many field lines are traveling through uh, this rectangle now? It's zero, right? All the, all the field lines either pass above or below it. No field lines will pass through this rectangle now. So going back to this, what does, what does E dot dA mean? What, how do you think of it? The way you think of it is, it is how many field lines pass through the surface. 
This quantity is called flux. There's an official quantity for it. It's called flux. Now, because it's an official quantity, there's a symbol for it. The mathematical symbol we use is actually Greek. It's the Greek letter phi, or phi, if you're Kent. And it's got a nice, neat formula. It is the integral of E dot dA. That is the calculus definition of flux. Now, hopefully, you can understand where the integral comes in. If I add up how many field lines pass through one part of my area or one part of my surface, and the integral is a fancy way of saying add some, 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 add, 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 add. If I, if I have multiple surfaces to form an object, and I integrate, I add up all of the electric field lines through all of my individual small surface segments, then I'm going to get the total, the total number of field lines that pass through the surface. So in this class, we, we won't dwell too much on the calculus. Um, so in this class, we assume that everything is nice and we, we won't really need intense calculus, if any at all. So we, we assume that everything here is nice and you can simply represent the flux by electric field times the area times cos theta. I know this is new. We will try to get to some examples, although today will not be the day. If anything, it'll be tomorrow. Um, but the, the, the location in which you can have time to practice these ideas will be in tutorial on Thursday to, uh, tomorrow. So um, there, there will be a time and a place for you to get your hands down and dirty with, with these ideas. OK, <clears throat> so where does that leave us? We started with this calculus on the left, which is the real definition of Gauss's law. And in our class, we're going to kind of sidestep the calculus a little bit and, and assume things are nice and well behaved. And we can represent the electric field flux, sort of the electric flux, with E times A times cos theta. And the right hand side of Gauss's law was, and it always has been, total Q over epsilon naught. And epsilon naught, as I mentioned earlier, is just simply a universal constant. It's got a it's got a value, 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12. Who cares? It is what it is. This is Gauss's law, plain and simple. Gauss's law says it relates the electric field, it relates the electric field to the source of the field. In this case, there is a source. It is charged particles. We've already been through this. A positive particle will, will produce an electric field. A negative particle will produce a different electric field, but an electric field nonetheless. So Gauss's law says, if we know how much charge we have, we should be able to predict what kind of electric field is produced by this charge. OK, let's do some examples of flux. So a Gaussian surface is, is defined to be the area in which we integrate over. I told you dA is an incrementally small chunk of area in the same way that dx is an incrementally small amount of x, right? Now, when you integrate, you integrate from, say, like 0 to 1, or like, you know, 0 to e, or 2 to 100, right? You integrate over a domain. And that means x ranges from 0 to 1, or like 0 to 100, OK? dA is just a small chunk of area. If you want to look at the whole area you're integrating over, that's called a surface. More specifically, that's called, in this case, because we're talking about Gauss's law, that's called a Gaussian surface. All right, so now that we've coined the term Gaussian surface, let's look at some examples of Gaussian surface. The brilliance and the flexibility of Gauss's law says, and I'll write Gauss's law again, the more times you see it, the better it is for you and your brain. 
The beauty of Gauss's law is that this is it. There's no corollaries. There's no quantifications that need to be done. There's no if, ands, or buts. There's no conditions. It's just that. That's Gauss's law. This says any closed area you pick, any closed area, you could choose a triangle, you could choose a star, you could choose a rectangle, you could choose a, a sphere, any closed area you want, you're going to get the same answer. That is a beautiful implication of Gauss's law. Nowhere in the statement of Gauss's law says you must use a certain shape. That's brilliant. Let's see why the answer will always turn out to be the same, regardless of the shape. Because I think that is just downright fascinating. You, you're probably scoffing right now, but anyway, uh, let's see why that's true. Any closed surface. How do we know what surface to draw? Let's pick a star, for instance, just for fun. We know it's E A cos theta. That's the flux, right? E A cos theta. Let's see if we can add up, or let's see if we can calculate the electric flux through the star for a second. Well, at this location here, we have a certain angle between the electric field and the shape. I don't know what that angle is, but it's something. And it is a certain distance away from the charged particle. Again, I don't know what that distance is, but it's something. If I move to the next location, let's say here, I am closer to the electric, uh, I'm closer to the charged particle. So that means my electric field will have gotten stronger. The angle that the black arrow has uh, with respect to the blue star is also different compared to where it was over here. So theta is different, the distance is different, which means depending where I am, I have vastly different flux. And our whole point with this is we don't yet presently have a formula for the E field which means if I'm in a different location and I am confident that at this other location, uh, it, it changes the strength of my electric field, I have zero ability to, to measure that or quantify that. So, you know, if we had the structure of the E field, then yes, we could use the star. We could go through all the complicated math and you'd see that when you say, uh, the, the, when you go through this and you say E, at x, y, z times, you know, d, a, cos theta, and you integrate that over the star, yes, you will get the same answer. The problem is we do not have the formula for E. That's what we're trying to obtain. The same problem arises with the square or the, the rectangle. You know, at this port, uh, location of the rectangle, you have almost a 45 degree angle, and um, the location is as far away from the charged particle as possible. Here, for instance, you are as close to the charged particle as, as you are allowed to be, so you're closer, the distance has changed, and the angle has changed. Here, uh, you're parallel. The normal to the surface is straight up, the E field is straight up, so the angle is zero. So again, if, if we had the E field ahead of time, then yes, we could perform Gauss's law, go through the rigorous um, calculus and deal with all the changing variables. Um, if you were a masochist, sure, go for it. You get the same answer. However, we do not have E, so this is not going to work. So we have to ask ourselves, okay, we know we have an integral. We know that flux is the integral of E dA cos theta. We know this is the formula. I don't want to do calculus because I'm just deadly lazy. I'm a physicist. Believe it or not, we hate math. We only use math because we need to, not because we like it. So if I had to simplify this, I would say, okay, I need to pick a surface that I'm integrating over that has three things. That one has a constant theta, has a constant angle 
between the surface and the E field everywhere. Because then if it's a constant as a, as a function of X, Y, Z, then as you know from calculus, if it's a constant, you can just factor it out of the integral. Okay, the other thing, E field. Again, if the E field is changing depending where you are along your surface, that's a problem. So if I want to avoid calculus, I just have to say, okay, I need to pick a surface in such a way that the E field is constant at every location x, y, z. Because again, if it's constant, you can factor it out. So this is, um, this is assumption one. This is assumption two. I told you there were three, so bear with me. Let's assume those two are implemented. So we can factor out E, we can factor out cos theta, and then we get the integral of dA. So what's my third assumption? Well, my third assumption is I actually need to know what the hell the, the, the area of the object is. Do you know offhand the area of a star? No, but I mean, it's, it's a geometrically nice-ish shape. So presumably, if you spent enough trouble, you could probably come up with the area of a star. Now, what if I drew a random area? What if I drew a random area like this? It's valid, it's closed. Gauss's law says as long as it's a closed surface, I'm good. Well, cool. Maybe, maybe this closed surface makes the E field constant everywhere. Maybe the E field is bendy in such a way that every time it crosses, every time it crosses the, um, uh, the surface here, maybe it crosses at a 90 degree angle, cool. But I don't know what the area is. If I have to integrate, if I have to integrate dA, well, the integral of dA is simply A. I mean, you know that from calculus. What's the integral of dx? X. What's the integral of du? U. What's the integral of dA? A. So the third assumption is that you need to actually know what the area is. Oh boy. What the area is. So those are the three assumptions. Now, in this case, if we have a point particle, like a, like a proton, for instance, what shape can we draw? What Gaussian surface can we draw that satisfies all three of those assumptions? What shape can we draw such that the electric field at every location along the surface has the same strength as one another? What shape can we draw such that the angle between the area vector and the E field is the same everywhere along the surface? And, what, and simultaneously, what shape can we draw where we also know the value of the surface area? And in this case, in this particular instance with a point particle, the answer is a sphere. Any location along the sphere, this, this sphere here, let's, let's take this location here. It has an angle of zero degrees from the area vector. Don't forget the area vector points normal to the surface. So the angle between the area vector and the E field is zero everywhere. Whether I draw my dot here, whether I draw my dot here, whether I draw my dot here, the area vector and the E field vector will always be parallel. So we're well on our way. One assumption, done. Okay, how about the strength of the E field? I still do not know how strong the E field is along this sphere. But what I do know is that the strength of the E field at this location, the strength of the E field at this location, the strength of the E field at this location, the strength of the E field at this location is the same as all of the other locations. It's unknown. I don't know what it is, but it's the same. That's my point. And as long as it's a constant, the same, I can factor it out of the integral. So we have finally reached our goal. We can finally use Gauss's law to obtain the formula for the E field 
And using that, we can then mul simply multiply by Q and then obtain the force with F equals QE. So let's do that right now. This is where all other physics profs and all other physics books, I think, can, can um, eat dirt, very bluntly speaking. I think they do a, a real piss poor job at introducing electrostatics. They just say, here's the electric force, here's Coulomb's law, let's move on with it. And it does not do it justice. So here's why. Let's finally, finally, finally reach our end goal. What is the, the electric force? Well, this, this means we have to ask, what's the electric force due to what? In this case, let's find out what the electric force is due, oops, that should be an E, due to a point charge. That's a very, very important distinction that you will soon see. Well, our steps here is pick a Gaussian surface. Well, in order to pick a Gaussian surface, you've already seen that you have to use some intuition and some creativity and some problem solving. We first sketch the E field that we know, right? So we know the E field due to a point charge will look like this. It'll look like a, a spherically symmetric uh, shape pattern. We've just finished discussing that we have our, our, our imagination's limit of, of Gaussian surfaces we can pick, stars, spheres, rectangles. We've also seen that not all of them are conducive for humans to be able to solve this easily. So let's go ahead and pick a sphere to be our Gaussian surface. Okay, that's step one, done. Step two, use Gauss's law to determine the structure of the E field. Okay, I will listen to myself. So Gauss's law says integral of E dot dA equals Q total over epsilon naught. I don't like calculus. So I'm gonna verify, are my three assumptions met? Is my electric force constant everywhere along my green Gaussian surface? Yes. Dot product, dot product of angles. Is the angle between dA and E constant everywhere along this Gaussian surface? Yes. So I can factor those out. E cos theta integral of dA equals Q total epsilon naught. Next, my third assumption. Do I know the A? Do I know the area of my Gaussian surface? The answer is yes. Do you know the surface area of a sphere? Okay, granted, it may have been a few years since you've needed that formula, but you can appreciate that spheres are very well known and very well behaved. And yes, it is known for pi r squared specifically. So um, I can go ahead and say the integral of dA is simply A, and get cos uh, EA cos theta equals Q total over epsilon naught. And it's not just any A. In this case, it's specifically the A of a sphere. And in this specific case, theta, theta happens to be 0, which means cos theta happens to be 1, because cos of 0 is 1. So my formula then becomes, E A of the sphere equals Q over epsilon naught. And my electric field is then E equals Q over A epsilon naught. And we know the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. And then there's that epsilon naught there from before. So there we have it there is the electric field due to a point charge. We call this the Coulombic, oops, Coulomb, the Coulombic E field.
It's called Coulombic because uh, the word Coulombic refers to an E field due to a single point charge. So far, we've only been talking about single point charges. You will see very shortly, maybe the beginning of tomorrow's lecture, maybe very briefly at the end of this lecture. There are other scenarios where you don't necessarily have a single individual point charge. I'm sure you can imagine that. Anyway, uh, let's finish this example. So two, two is done. We've used Gauss law to obtain the E field. It's KQ, uh, not K, sorry, it's Q over four pi epsilon naught times R squared. And then lastly, we use the relationship S equals QE to find the electric force. So here, my electric force is going to be um, some unknown charge Q. So if I wanted to place uh, a second charge Q nearby, that's what that Q would be, times the electric field. The electric field, oops, uh, according to our previous step, is the source. I will say source here divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. And um, you will notice that 4 is a constant, pi is a constant, epsilon naught is a constant. Don't know about you. I'm a physicist. I am very lazy. I don't want to write three constants because they're just constants. Why can't they just multiply them together, find out whatever their value is, and then just write one constant? That's just way easier for me. So if you actually do this, if you calculate one divided by four pi epsilon naught, you end up getting nine times 10 to the nine. Try it with your calculator if you don't believe me. Nine times 10 to the nine. So I've just called this, and so have many textbooks, K. Because <clears throat> why not? It's just a constant. So I'm gonna lump all the constants together and I'm gonna get K, Q1, Q2, this is, I guess, Q1, this is analogous to Q2 over R squared. And that is where Coulomb's law comes from. That is what all the textbooks in high school, uh, even, even your textbook, even the G.N. Coley book, every single physics book I've seen skips over this narrative, skips over this, like, this sort of storytelling, and it does not really explain where the Coulombic force comes from. Why is it R squared? Because it's the area of a sphere, and that happens to be R squared. Okay, that is where Gauss, uh, that, that's where Gauss's law is used. Now, please understand, Gauss's law is all-encompassing. Coulomb's law is not. Coulomb's law is but one specific application, right? Coulomb's law occurs when only when you have a single, oops, it's in a different location, a single point source. The very moment that you no longer have one single point source, Coulomb's law is wrong because that completely changes the Gaussian surface that you require to satisfy those three assumptions. The three assumptions being your Gaussian surface needs to have a constant E field everywhere, your Gaussian surface needs to have a constant theta everywhere, and your Gaussian surface needs to have an, an area value that you are able to quantify. Okay, so there's Coulomb's law. It is specifically the force between two individual point particles. The, the Coulombic E field is the E field generated by a single particle. And the Coulombic force is the force between two particles. You can't have a, an electric force between a particle and itself. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, there's the formula. Um, it's very analogous it, uh, in structure to the gravitational force. Um, you can see now, <clears throat> You can see now why uh, Einstein died trying to unify the fundamental forces of physics because they have very similar structures and he did not believe that this was a coincidence. Um, <clears throat> you can actually use field theory to derive GMM over R squared as well. Uh, it follows something called inverse square law. We see this with most of the fundamental forces of nature. And please, this is a really, really big one right here. This does not represent any arbitrary electric force. It only represents the electric force between two point particles. Okay, so uh, we're gonna end this lecture with a summary of what we've talked about so far. And we're gonna resume tomorrow's lecture with some Gauss's Law examples. 
And then we're going to move on in, in lecture tomorrow as well on to, I think, voltage and some other things. Um, and then you're going to have a tutorial uh, Thursday afternoon or evening, depending which section you're in. And uh, hopefully you can practice some of these ideas. So here's, here is the second summary. Since the first summary, we have now deduced that there are four uh, equations that govern electromagnetism. There's electrostatics, magnetostatics, electrodynamics, magnetodynamics. So four equations, four topics. Gauss's law is the first of the four. And Gauss's law relates the electric flux to the total charge, meaning Gauss's law allows us to calculate the electric field uh, given a distribution of charges. Number four, we always, always, always fall back to use Gauss's law when we need to obtain a formula for the electric force. Always. It's the same process of how you do free body diagram, F net equals MA, when you do forces questions. Here, when you need the electric force, you do diagram, Gaussian surface, and then you do Gauss's law. Always. It's the same sort of algorithmic idea. Uh, that's what number seven says. <clears throat> We've introduced this notion of epsilon naught. It's a universal constant. Um, it's a measure of how easily the electric field can, can penetrate through, through the medium that it's in. So the electric field will obviously have a harder time penetrating through concrete than, say, air. Um, Physicists are lazy, number nine. Physicists are lazy. So uh, one divided by four times pi times epsilon naught is simply just a constant. So we can replace that with saying nine times 10 to the nine. Uh, this is analogous to the gravitational constant. Uh, using, uh, using Gauss's law, we can easily, relatively easily, obtain Coulomb's law. And we can use F equals QE to ob obtain Coulomb's law for um, force and relate the Coulomb's law for electric field to the electric force. Um, we will talk about 13, 14, and 15 tomorrow because we don't have time to do it today. But um, you may remember from high school, there is a common scenario called a parallel plate capacitor. And um, that is another scenario in which you've got two charged objects that are not point particles. And uh, they do not follow KQ1, Q2 over R. So um, this really illustrates the importance of understanding Gauss's law and understanding that Coulomb's law is not the be all and end all of the formulas. But we will talk about that tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll pick up with some examples to make sure we're kind of remember where we are. And then tomorrow we're gonna continue on um, talking about, oh, there's a lot of examples here. Um, oh, wow, a lot of examples here. Okay, tomorrow we will talk about, um, where is it? Oh, okay, there it is, parallel plate capacitor. So yeah, um, I've just scrolled through a bunch of examples which we will do before moving on um, to parallel plate capacitors, but we will get there eventually. Uh, okay, so that, that concludes the second lecture. It was jam packed full of information. Um, I would mostly recommend when you're going back to study, please understand the narrative, the story we told ourselves. Um, the story might be confusing at the moment, but as the course progresses, I will try to remind you of what the story was in lecture number two. And hopefully that gives you some perspective on kind of how things are unraveling as they unravel. Okay, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording now. So if you're watching on YouTube, I will see you tomorrow. And I'm going to hang around the group chat for a few minutes to see if I can answer any uh, pressing questions. Ciao for now.